Hey guys, it's May at Markets with May. And um, today is September the 8th and we are having your typical weirdness in the markets as per usual. Um, let's go ahead and share screen. Past performance is not indicative of future returns. And um, you can really see from the indices, this thing is bouncing all over the place. At one point, I think we were down 50 basis points, up 50 basis points. It's a very undecided market. I'm glad to see crude oil correcting past the 83. Like I said, it really doesn't have any business, in my opinion, being below 90. I know people think GDP is just going to get clobbered globally, and that's going to somehow magically send the price of oil down. OPEC clearly is not going to make more. And we really don't know what's going to happen globally on energy usage with what everybody is doing to kind of manage the fact that they don't have any oil. The U.S. is a different animal, um, as are a couple of different countries, but really the U.S. is a different animal. And we are, but you know, just look at what the U.S. and China uses in the way of oil and compare that to the rest of the world. You can see that it's not insignificant. Plus, we still have to re-up our reserves since we released them. There hasn't been much talk about actually refilling those tanks. And at 80 bucks, we'd be refilling them way higher than where we let it go. So um, those are just some dynamics to keep in mind. We're not the only ones, by the way, that release reserves. So you do have that natural amount of demand that just exists out there. And, you know, kind of is what it is right this minute. But if you think about it, given where we released it, given inflation, you can kind of see what might be a way that that plays out to where people don't look hella stupid for having released reserves. So anyways, um, just wanted to kind of give you those two cents on that. Today, we're going to talk about a dividend yielding stock that I just kind of wanted to put out there. I think the timing, you may still have a bit of timing, but given that there's a lot of focus now on dividend yielding stocks in the current market environment with high concerns on GDP, I do think it's prudent that folks start to consider their asset allocation mix. For many times, for you know, some of you guys that are watching me um, are day traders. Awesome. That is a style of investment. It's not my style of investment, but I think it can be very uh, profitable if you get great at it. It does have like some starter of cost to learn that field. For me, I'm more of a fundamental investor. So I do want to try, even though I do trade a, a bit because I'm doing it via the options market. So I want, but I do have certain parts of my own personal capital that I absolutely put in a variety of different, call it style, style biases. And one of them is dividend yielding stocks. Um, so we're going to go through one of my favorites or one of the ones that I'm researching. My position's rather small in this at this point, um, but I'm watching it for days when stupid stuff happens, for lack of a better way to say it. And that's Well Tower. Um, okay, so really briefly, um, there wasn't, I don't think the economic dude news was really what drove things today in particular, although you are getting that weirdness off the PMI numbers and ISM manufacturing numbers that we discussed yesterday. And we'll continue to see dispersion on those economic data points, which is just a curiosity and a strangeness that we're all just going to have to absorb and figure out what to do with. That is what it is. Um, sorry, I have the wrong stuff. Thursday today. So we have jobless claims, consumer credit will be coming out at three o'clock today. We will be watching consumer credit, even though this typically is not a leading indicator of some sort that makes this passionate change in the marketplace. So just so you know, traditionally, however, because we're all really concerned about the health of the U.S. consumer, given that it has been doing a set of things to help uh, maintain not just uh, the health of the U.S. economy and how it looks, but globally, you know, people are selling stuff to us, so to speak. Um, so that number, though less important among economic data points, may be something relevant, but we'll see how it goes in a couple hours. And and so with that, I do want to talk about Well Tower. Um, I will do a little bit of baby macro on this, but honestly, it is baby macro because I just want to give you, if you do your own due diligence on this, which I always recommend, you do it in conjunction with your personal broker dealer. I know some of you guys do you actually have your accounts at places that do have a research department. You can ask them for more details. But the reason that you would care about Well Tower or the two other S&P names that do this particular type of, of, of there, it's a REIT, a real estate investment trust. So this particular type of real estate investment trust is because it is, it is by and large, it is going to be focused on the aging population. Now, 
from a GIX perspective, GIX, which is the Global Industry Classification System, it is GIX'd as a medical REIT, okay? But they're not all medical REITs are made the same. Some medical REITs focus in on hospitals or other like doctor's offices, that sort of thing. Some medical REITs are senior living only. Some are a bit of a mixture and so on and so forth. Well Tower um, is primarily going to be focused on senior living, and then they do hospice care, which is still part of the aging uh, population. And then they may have a few doctor's offices as well in the mix. But I'm going to show you all of that so that if you're walking through REITs, which definitely have a different style of investment than traditional fundamental investor, at least you'll know kind of a different perspective. Now, part of the reason I decided to do this is when I was looking at all the other REIT stuff, I realized that some folks may not realize that the statistics that work for other stocks are the complete not relevant statistics for the real estate investment trust. So I was like, oh, I'm overdue for a tutorial here uh, for, for the general population. And then some of you already know the REIT's cold. So hopefully this is helpful if you haven't looked at Welltower before. Um, but I'm not going to be exhaustive about it. So if for folks, just so you know why people even care about companies like Welltower, um, Veritas would be another one. And then Health Peak would be the, the third one within my space. And then there's probably a whole seal, sea of other smaller REITs that do senior living and senior care. But the aging demographics look like this. Globally, 22% of the population will be by 2050. But each country kind of has its own dynamic. So in the US, and, but you still kind of need to know globally because given uh, how big these big cap companies are, it isn't impossible or even outside of the realm of their capability to start to have some properties overseas. Now, during COVID, it just so happened that a couple of the guys sold, a couple of the guys in this space sold their properties in like Ireland, the UK, et cetera. But it's not like historically, these guys have not gone overseas. Traditionally, the developed markets tend to have an increasing amount of aging population versus the emerging markets, which do tend to keep a very particular um, curve and, and demographic. Um, and, and also, but the, the developed markets have two dynamics. First, um, an aging population in general. Second, three dynamics. Second, because of healthcare improvements, people live significantly longer. I'm gonna show you that in a second. And third, and most importantly, um, there's not as much of a cultural bias for, for the um, senior person to stay with the children um, as they age. And, and so those three dynamics are in general uh, very positive for this space at large, but particularly in the United States. What we see here is that these are the demographic data that um, are posted off of Statista. It comes from the US Census, which is taken once every 10 years. But you can see that from 2010 to 2020, and they're projecting for 2030, a huge, huge increase in the old age population 65 plus. And then it tapers out, but I'm just gonna tell you, look, the other thing I do is I'm a data scientist, so I know what this is. This is them normalizing an aging population versus making some kind of metric that this would actually continue through infinity. So they're doing that here. So this tail end right here, projection through 2050, you can just assume that that's BS. No one knows, right? So, so that's what's going on there. Um, so this number suggests that unless you think that the population of the United States is in decline, when you then do the percentages, it's actually a physical body count that is quite a bit higher than you might see from the percentage basis. And that's really what we're talking about when it comes to senior living. Now, before I go too much further, realize that senior living has come a long way. There are those nursing homes that are in every movie and film, but there's also senior living that's kind of cool. It, it's like basically a amazing like resort condo type thing, but then there's nurses and there's like medical arrangements that are made. And then a lot of, um, you know, ADA compliant ramps and um, people that absolutely come in there and clean and all that other stuff. So, so within senior living, there's actually quite a bit of innovation for anyone, whether it's well tower or something else, it's something absolutely to investigate. Um, senior living in general got absolutely clobbered as a group. And it got clobbered as a group during COVID because COVID caused major issues as relates to whether or not people wanted their uh, loved ones in a senior living facility and then what that might mean to bring mom and dad home um, in a safer environment and not have them there. 
Additionally, during COVID, there were a lot of additional requirements for people to come and visit their loved ones. And so you saw occupancy rates go down into the low 70s across all of the senior living. So I wanna show that here's the occupancy rates of Well Tower. Spot occupancy, this is 2020, so you already had a little bit of, um, yeah, so you can kind of see it dropped down significantly and now it's starting to come back up. They do not, you know, Well Tower, if anyone from Well Tower is listening, you guys gotta put your occupancy rates per quarter. Like literally every other REIT does. That's the only whining you're gonna hear from me on, well, it's not the only thing. There's a couple things you guys do on the numbers that drive me a little insane, but this is one of them. I would love to see the occupancy rates a little bit better and I would love to see the occupancy rates. Hold on one second, you guys, I'm gonna stop share and just turn that off so that sound isn't on the constant. Um, so um, anyways, the occupancy rates is a thing that you do definitely wanna watch for all REITs. In this case, we're just looking for a recovery in those occupancy rates, which is people making the choice to go into senior living versus staying with friends and family or hiring a private nurse. Oh, I should also pause on that. Some people, you always think of, oh, it's the kids putting them in a home, but given how attractive some of these uh, newer properties are in the innovation within senior living, there are people that are making a choice to choose that once they become uh, truly having difficulty with mobility. And so, and additionally, for some folks that might be a little bit older watching this, you probably know well, um, yeah, you probably know well, sorry, I just have to double check because I have an aging parent, so I also have to check that out a lot occasionally. But for some folks, they just kind of prefer having still the freedom of being um, a senior despite having some mobility issues and knowing that they can very quickly get a ride to the hospital. There's a couple, particularly in the Florida area, where they're actually, the property of the hospital is large enough where you additionally have... Um, as a, you know, a very quick ride to the hospital, if that's what it is. So it's very interesting. There's a lot of really fascinating things that are going on within this space of senior care. So, um, you know, going into this situation, I think you had like a low 80s for a lot of these senior living, senior care facilities. And then as you moved into COVID, these guys got really beaten up, but it was never the case the financials were so horrendous. And I want to show you that because I think a lot of times when people are doing financials on this, they're looking at traditional met metrics, which are not accurate and not quite the way that you would do it for REITs. And if, if there's nothing else that you gain, if you have no interest in senior living, it, maybe that can be a beneficial to you. But so here you can see very clearly quarter over quarter, a significant recovery from that 2020 period. So we're well over um, and starting to get into the occupancy rates that you would want to start to see for this business model to play out. Now, I want to show you this as well. The way that these guys do, and hopefully I've got all the slides from their uh, 10K, but this is from their uh, most, I think this is from their quarterly release. Yeah, this is from their quarterly release. You can see that there are a couple of different categories of the way that you divide up there in slice and dice. The ridiculous amount of properties, ridiculously wonderful amount of properties, let me say it that way, that, that comprise uh, Well Towers property group. First, there's a senior housing operation. That is um, a regular lease, so to speak. That it's what you think of as leases. But then there's this concept called triple net leases. And what triple net leases are, triple net leases are lease agreements where the tenant pays everything. So they all all things are passed through from the portion of the lease. So CapEx is passed through. Um, CapEx is passed through, expenses are passed through, maintenance is passed through, everything is passed through uh, to um, everything is passed through to the tenant, and, um, and and so you don't necessarily have that variation that happens on one-off changes. It turns out that all so many of the leases, so many of the real estate investment trusts are trying to strike triple net re leases because it stabilizes the cash flow. But you do get slightly lower year over year growth because the type of company that's going to do that is a little bit of a different animal. Um, but you have you will see and you have seen, which I'll show you in a bit, increasing number of properties in the senior housing section moved to triple net leases and. That just is a thing, but you can see now, whereas during the early COVID periods or even last year, you weren't getting that year over year growth. Now that we've kind of normalized and people are just learning to live with this beautifully crazy and 
environment that we all find ourselves in, you are seeing that stabilize and those year over year situation uh, across all of the different types. But you've got uh, return to what would have been considered normalized growth. Now, with respect to well tower or any of the REITs, that is a bet that you are making. So just realize that. But given the nature of these properties, I'm quite comfortable with that bet. You should make that decision for yourself. So see these two, senior housing and senior housing triple net lease, just describe the difference in how you would think those leases roll. So here, if there's major changes that you believe are happening as relates to senior care, senior repayment, because some of this is covered by Medicaid, Medicare, et cetera, that would be this section. Triple net would also benefit from that, but maybe if there's certain types of um, you know, state benefits for them developing, et cetera, that's going to maybe have a slightly different modeling impact on these two areas. Outpatient medical if you don't know what that is, drive by a hospital and look at the outpatient medical portions that, and go in and ask, honestly, and you can get a sense for that. But that is a significantly smaller portion of their business. And then health system, uh, this is just other doctor's offices, that sort of thing. And long-term post-acute care, these two, some of that is also hospice care, as is outpatient. And so, so depending on the nature of how the hospice is set up, uh, these three, it can fall in any one of these three, depending on the, the nature of that. But so, so it really is the older population that this particular, um, this particular stock is focused in on. Now, net operating. Oh, okay. So then the other thing I just kind of want to show you as relates to that, these are the growth rates that they were expecting long-term across each of the different business units. And realize too, that for any real estate investment trust, they are buying and selling properties at any given time, but approximately um, net operating, um, yeah, net operating income is what we're talking about. Um, and I will go through what that means, but net operating income is the number that you want, not EPS. Okay. So if you see any videos where they're talking EPS, that part, and it's a REIT, that person may not fully understand REITs. So just go to the next video is what I would say, but net operating income is one of several metrics that you do actually care about as relates to REITs. And I'll talk about why in a second, but of those three breakouts, this is the breakout that they see currently for long-term growth expectations, at least for the next 12 months, but we shall see after that. It's probably for a bit longer than that because there is a lot of wood to chop in this particular area, given what's happening with demographics. And quite frankly, given how votes play out, how the voting population plays out, this is probably only going to continue to move toward them as an as a economic and political environment versus away from these types of companies. Um, so these are the types of grows. Senior housing, which does comprise the bulk of, of their assets, is going to grow, although the triple net leases grow a little slower than um, the housing operation, than the regular leases, so to speak, um, net operating leases. Okay, the other couple of things I just want to show you so you can see it. Um, Oh yeah, so this allows you to see net operating income improvements over the period of time. If you were to compare this, I should have probably put a little red box to this, you can see how much that is absolutely um, improved. This was in their quarterly statements. So you can take a look at this and you can see the pro rata, not net operating income is almost like it's it's just up so much. The others are actually just more stable stable income producers because these triple net leases oftentimes are very long in tooth. They're just going to have normal kind of inflationary additions in there, plus maybe a couple of other um, metrics that are put in there. So they won't because it's just the nature of how those leases are struck. Um, the mix, um, I did that already. Uh, oh yeah, I want to show you this. This is what can be very relevant in this kind of environment. And it has to do with the dividend yield. Currently, the dividend yield is uh, $2.44 is what they're saying, which equates at today's prices at about a three and a quarter, 3.2% uh, dividend yield. And for a company that's doing quite well and does have prospects of growth, that can be a beautiful thing. So I wanted to show it because it is in the category of set it and forget it because it'll just give you a little bit of capital. Again, when we say it has a high dividend yield, I mean it relative to the S&P 500, which is going to clock in closer to about a two and change percent dividend yield. You're going to get more than that. Plus, this company, given what it does, is a little bit insulated from inflation and also 
you know, all the other stuff that you that uh, that we're worried about in this economic environment. But the reason that you cannot use um, net income as the number and subsequent to net income EPS, which is going to be a derivative of net income, it's price divided by earnings, that earnings is net income divided by total shares outstanding, diluted if you've got someone that's doing it correctly, you can't use it. And the reason you can't use it is because in REIT land, there is a lot of depreciation and amortization. I mean, look, look how gigantic DNA is relative to net income, okay? So anyone trying to do a metric to EPS, I'm just going to say it, they need to spend a little bit more time understanding this industry, the entire industry of REITs. They have no business making videos on it. Sorry, I'm just going to call it out. Okay, so, but we look at usually funds from operation is the, 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 the number that you would use because it puts back in DNA it puts back in impairment and losses. There are always going to be some non-controlling interest, et cetera, et cetera. So people like to use FFO. I'm cool if people use EBITDA as well, because it will take into consideration some of the cash that's coming in and out due to properties and asset sales, as well as DNA is added back in to EBITDA, earnings before interest tax. Okay. But FFO is the cleanest and you can kind of see what you're looking for there is because of what funds from operation is, it would be what you would be paying your dividend with. So again, you guys have seen some of my other videos. We're trying to figure out, can they pay the dividend or not? If you do the math, 61 cents per quarter is what they're giving you on an A-REIT FFO basis, 90 cents is what they're making per quarter in the last quarter. So they're doing just fine to give you your dividend back. And, 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 and so that's kind of how you would look at it. There's no problem in paying the dividend here. And um, that should get you started if Well Tower is interesting. As relates to the market, though, it's so skittish and it's so crazy. Um, after you do your valuation work, if you're like, set it and forget it, I can't be bothered. This could trade down a touch before it trades up that sort of thing. For me, if I can get it at a three and a half percent dividend yield, I'll be so exceptionally thrilled. I may start to take a nibble a bit more um, here and there because I already do have a starter position on this, um, but I'm looking for just a little bit more downside because I'm cheap. I really don't have another way to say it. And with that, I will stop, share, and take any questions that you might have on that. David, how are you doing today? Good, <laughs> good. Thank you, man. <laughs> okay. I, as we baby boomers retire go into town i don't want to go i mean how many people really go i mean want to go into these retirement are the is it a retirement home or is it like a um uh more of a hospital setting it's actually kind of the innovation has been really so even at regardless like everyone needs to just see that it exists because everyone either is themselves aging or has aging parents so i recommend that if there's some of these facilities nearby you just go check them out and actually oh you know what i'm pretty sure i forgot to share that hopefully i have that if not i'll try to prepare it because what's happening in innovation in this area is pretty freaking cool like some of these things literally look like a resort and there's just like a nursing station there as well that you can call if you have a sudden like medical need. And then they make sure to come and see that you're alive once a day. And so so there's, there's everything from like what we traditionally think of as nursing home, hospital, really miserable looking thing. I know like at, at our ages, we've definitely had to go to a hospice before. And that's really depressing and sad, despite the fact that those people work really hard to make it a good place for your, your loved ones to be. But there are also these things that almost look like a shared community. Do you know what I mean? So like mm -hmm. you've got you've got essentially a big condo building with a shared living space that has activities for people that have mobility issues. Do you know what I mean? And then you've just got you know a nurse that checks in once a day. And then if you you personally, as a person, are worried about your parents, you call the front desk and have them go check your mom, see if they're if everything's okay. You know what I mean? Like it's actually kind of a cool thing. Some of the innovation that's happening in this area. So there's a mix, is what I'm saying. Okay, yeah. I mean, we, we put our mother in within the entire space. Uh, it was nice, but the 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 care was not adequate. Yeah, that's tr that's true. So it depends. I mean, like I think. I'm going to say yes. And also, I think Well Tower and Veritas tend to be on the higher end of the spectrum. Veritas Health Peak and, 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 um, 
So I would say Health Peak definitely is a great one to investigate. You really should investigate all three. All of three do have reasonably good dynamics. It's just that Well Tower probably did the best this quarter of the three. But Health Peak in particular has the truly higher end ones that you pay up for a bit. Right. It seems to be, um, I mean, hospice is very serious, right? Hospice it's, is when you're really going there. You, you know, right. you know, my dad was in hospice right. before he passed. <laughs> this is going to be the most depressing of all the videos we've done. But <laughs> when you're like, when you're like 85 to 90 years old and you're not in hospice, you be in I, think care you need more, I think you need more attention than a 80 year old or 75 year old. Correct. I mean, it really I mean, depends. Because it's, it's not it seems like there should be different levels of, uh, care for you know is 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 uh not age but uh, this, uh health and mobility yes so for example this is the mix of real estate as of 2021 now they've done some pro this is the 10k that was put out i think i think they're actually on a they do it just after january so um i think but double check but this was the 10k um, their last 10K, they have done some asset sales and some rejiggering subsequent to that, but you can kind of see, so senior, so down here below is the relationship mix. And so Sunrise Senior Living is for people that still have full mobility for the most part, but some of these are for folks specifically that have dementia, that sort of thing. And dementia is a lot. Sometimes people you know, if they if they have their home set up in a particular way, they can take that care into their own home. But sometimes, depending on the age of parent and the other medical difficulties that are happening, um, mm -hmm. and, and if there's children, it's an, it's an unfortunate solution that really does have to happen. And so that's the the, the um, situation that we're discussing with respect to senior living. So you still needed to have like a nice, happy, friendly place, but it's not um it's not a hospice at that point that sort of thing i mean there's there's the the variation because this aging population is becoming so um large globally but specifically in the us as right. well you know the, the you know whereas before there may have been like exactly three types of options the variation that's happening is increasing within senior care um and um yeah <laughs> and for better or for worse, uh, there are folks that are trying hard to create reasonable options for um, for where you can for how you can work it out with your loved ones. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a good. It looks like they have different levels then. That's exactly um, right. Yeah. But the, what concerns me: sixty-six percent remaining. I mean, that's a lot remaining. Those are the good. Those are the ones that are able to get around, right? I think, what do you mean, Where which slide was I on with the 66% remaining? Say it to me again. That previous slide, it says mix. The previous oh, oh. slide. Yeah, uh, hold on, let me go back to that. I see what you're saying. Um, this one right here. Yeah, at so, the very bottom, see relationship mix? Very bottom, it says remaining. Oh, that's the other states. So most of their exposure, this is this is a mix of real estate. Okay. Oh, really glad you asked it this way. So they just do the real estate. There's a service provider that rent that leases those buildings. So Sunrise Senior Living, their oh. majority of their facilities, they lease from Well Tower or um, the other two companies that do this, that are the landlords for these senior living facilities, would be um Veritas and also um who is Veritas? No, it's not Veritas. It's B. BTX is the symbol. Vertex. Oh my gosh, I've been saying the wrong thing the entire time. Uh, I, um, let's just get this right so that I'm not completely. And it's so sad because I actually think the CEO, I'm a real fan of, of how she. Oh my gosh, I'm going to have to come back to you. All right, you know what? I'll come back to you in a different video and give you the correct, or, or I'll just post it in the show notes. But there, um, and I have such admiration for her as the CEO, but I can't remember the name of it right this minute. Anyways, there are two other companies within the S&P 500 that do senior living. Um, Health Peak, I think, is the other one. That ticker is Peak, and you should compare and contrast and see which one makes more sense for you. Health Peak, um, great CEO there, too. A lot of like mm -hmm. transition of which properties, but they are just landlords. So they also don't take on that risk of liability that you have with senior care in general. They're only going to take tenant risk as far as that goes, but they do have to provide certain types of facilities 
they might be buying up old senior living facilities and doing capital expenditures to upgrade it so that they could then rent it to the appropriate folks, um, that sort of thing. That's why I like them a little better than just flat out medical care for seniors. Does that make sense? Oh, yes, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so the remaining here, yeah, the remaining here is just other other companies such as Sunrise Senior Living or ProMedica or Avery, the remaining relationship mix, these are the biggest portions and do comprise 40% of their uh, revenue each year. And then these states, uh, the ones that we know and love, they're actually not in Florida so much, but um, comprise the bulk of where they're at. Um, oh, yeah, right. They're in the United Kingdom. I should have known that. So, yeah, there is a little bit of international exposure as well. Yeah, I've heard that it's a big issue in China. Ch China. Yeah. Also. yeah, it is. I mean, senior living is something that we're all hopefully knock on wood. Everybody has a nice, beautiful, long life. Um, none of these operators, I think, would be in Asia because Asia has its own additional uniqueness um, and, and the such. So these, I think, if anything, someone, so um, this UK exposure oftentimes is Ireland, um, Wales, Scotland, the United Kingdom, and there's a whole mix of stuff that's going on there as well as a whole mix of, um, you, like, to really understand the companies that rent from them, you'll need to understand what's done to support senior medical in general. For us, it's Medicare, Medicaid. For them overseas, it's something different. And so each country is a little bit different in how that rolls. But again, um, what we care about for these companies that I'm talking about is the fact that those operators then rent space. And these guys are responsible for making that space something wonderful for the operators. Now, I know some of you guys who have looked at all these are like, may the world wonderful, it might not be the right word. I get it, I get it. But nonetheless, um, like, you know, adjectives aside, it, it is a very intriguing business. And it is one that probably will not give you a lot of risk to your, uh, to your, to your dividend in your shareholder return. Got it. Okay, thank you. All right, cool. Well, thanks, guys. Uh, have be safe out in these markets and take care. See you tomorrow.